Dear Mr. President, with all due respect, sir, I must tell you that you are wrong about ISIL. You said ISIL speaks for no religion. I'm a former Muslim. My dad is an imam. I spent more than 20 years studying Islam. I hold a bachelor degree in religious studies, and I'm in the middle of my master's degree in terrorism studies. I can tell you with confidence that ISIL speaks for Islam. Allow me to correct you, Mr. President. ISIL is a Muslim organization. Its name stands for Islamic State. So even the name suggests that it is an Islamic movement. Their leader, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, holds a PhD in Islamic studies. I doubt you know Islam better than he does. He was a preacher and a religious leader in one of the local mosques in Baghdad. ISIL's 10,000 members are all Muslims. None of them are from any other religion. They come from different countries and have one common denominator, Islam. They are following Islam's prophet Muhammad in every detail. They imitate him by growing their beards, shaving their mustaches, and in the way they dress. They follow his command in the hadith to differentiate themselves from the infidels by wearing, by wearing their watches on the right instead of the left hand. They implement Sharia in every piece of land they conquer. They pray five times a day. They have called for a caliphate, which is a central doctrine in Sunni Islam, and they are willing to die for their religion. They are following the steps of Islam's prophet Muhammad to the letter. By the way, if you want to understand ISIL, read the oldest biography of Muhammad by Ibn Hisham. This is their model for action. You think that ISIL does not speak for Islam because they beheaded an American and they killed those whom they consider infidels. In the same way, Islam's prophet Muhammad beheaded in one day between 600 and 900 adult males in a Jewish tribe called Banu Quraiza. In fact, beheading is commanded in the Quran, in Surah 47, the fourth verse. It says, when you meet the unbelievers and fight, smite at their necks. Ironically, this Surah is called the Surah of Muhammad. Killing prisoners is also an order from Allah to Muhammad and to all Muslims. It says it is not for a prophet to have captives of war until he inflicts a massacre upon Allah's enemies in the land. Quran 8:67. And by the way, three of Muhammad's wives were Jewish girls he kidnapped from his raids on the religious minorities, just as ISIL is doing today. Mr. President, I grew up in Morocco, supposedly a moderate country, yet I still learned at a young age to hate the enemies of Allah, especially Jews and Christians. These are represented today by Israel and the West, especially the great Satan, America. I prayed five times a day, repeating Al-Fatiha, the first chapter in the Quran, asking Allah to lead me not in the way of those who went astray and those who have the wrath of Allah upon them. We all knew that it is Jews and Christians. We have been brainwashed to hate all of you in our sacred texts, in our prayers, in our Friday sermons, in our educational systems. We were ready to join any group that one day would fight you and destroy you and make Islam the religion of the whole world as the Quran says. This is what I and millions like me have been taught. Mr. President, this is an irrevocable fact. Fortunately, when I grew up, I chose to leave Islam and became a Christian because I believed that God is love. Others also left and still every day they are leaving Islam and choosing different paths for their lives. 
All of them are suffering today because again, Islam's prophet Muhammad said, whoever changes his religion, kill him. I left Morocco under persecution. I was fortunate. Others throughout the Muslim world do not have the same opportunity. They are paying a heavy price in different ways in order to get their freedom one day. I ask you, Mr. President, to stop being politically correct, to call things by their names. ISIL, Al-Qaeda, Boko Haram, Al-Shabaab in Somalia, the Taliban, and their sister brand names are all made in Islam. Unless the Muslim world deals with Islam and separates religion from state, we will never end this cycle. Until you deal with the root of the problem, we will be just dealing with the symptoms. ISIL is just one symptom. If it disappears, other ISILs will be born under different names. You might ask, then why does ISIL kill other Muslims? The answer is that they consider them infidels, not Muslims. Do you know that all four schools in Islam agree that if a Muslim stops praying, he should be asked to repent, and if he does not, he should be killed? Do you know that Muhammad tried to burn his own companions when they stopped coming to prayers? So anything that qualifies a Muslim to be an infidel can be a reason for killing him, even neglecting to pray. If Islam is not the problem, then why is it that there are millions of Christians in Middle East and yet none of them has ever blown up himself to become a martyr? Even though they live under the same economic and political circumstances and even worse. Why have many Muslims in the West also joined ISIL if Islam is not the reason? Why have even new converts to Islam become terrorists? Mr. President, if you really want to fight terrorism, then fight it at the root. How many Saudi sheikhs are preaching hatred? How many Islamic channels are indoctrinating people and teaching them violence from the Quran and the Hadith? How many Friday sermons are made against the West, freedom and democracy? How many Islamic schools are producing generations of teachers and students who believe in jihad and martyrdom and fighting the infidels? And finally, how many websites are funded by governments, your allies, that have sheikhs or issue fatwas against basic human rights? If you want to fight terrorism, start from there. By the way, I do not give my full name because Islam is a religion of peace. I'm known around the whole world as Brother Rashid, and I implore you to take a stand for international human rights and the future of democracy and speak the truth about the real threat that is facing all of us. Best regards, Brother Rashid. <laughs> أحمد من السويد شيخ أحمد من السويد مرحبا بك سلام عليك مخ رشيد سلام ليك تفضل أخوي مخ رشيد نعم أنا طلعت على طلعت على الآيات اللي حكيتها أها وهو كلهم صحيح ونحن لسنا خارجين في ديننا وسنظل نقاتل حتى آخر يوم في حياتنا نعم ف... كل ما قلت هو صح ونقاتلهم في السويد وسنقاتلكم في أينما كنتم حتى تقولون لا إله إلا الله يعني أنت تقول لنا أنا سأقاتل أي واحد غير مسلم حتى يصير مسلم لحد آخر يوم بحياتنا وسنأخذ السويد ونأخذ أوروبا كلها أيضا وأنت الآن في السويد أنا في السويد مم. عند الكفار يعني نعم تأكل من أموالهم وتشرب من نحن ناكل, نحن ناكل... ناكل من أموال الله ليس من أموالهم يعني تأخذ من الحكومة أيضا تستفيد منها وكل شيء أي نحن نأكل من أموال الله ليس أموالهم طيب لماذا لا تذهب إلى أرض الإسلام مثلا إلى مكة إلى مسقط رأس النبي إلى المدينة المنورة حتى تستمتع بقبر النبي وأرض الإسلام وتستمتع ب ب ب بالإسلام في أرضه لماذا ذهبت عند الكفار 
نحن هنا في محمد يعني يعني ننشر ديننا لكن أنت تعرف أنه حرام أنك تترك بلاد الإسلام وتعيش في بلاد الكفر دون اضطرار بلاد الإسلام هي بلاد الله بأكملها كل خريطة العالم طيب إذا أنا أسألك في هذه النصوص لما قال محمد لقد جئتكم بالذبح أنت تقول هذا الكلام أنه صحيح صحيح مئة بالمئة وأنا أمرت أن أقاتل الناس حتى يشهدوا أن لا إله إلا الله وأن محمد رسول الله هي أيضا صحيح مئة بالمئة نعم وسنقاتلهم ونحن لسنا خجلون في ديننا طيب كيف تقول أنه رحمة للعالمين ما هو تعريف الرحمة رحمة للعالمين كيف يعني رحمهم عندما يدفعون الجزية ولا يقتلهم ليس رحمة منتهى الرحمة طيب وكيف رحم مثلا الناس الذين قتلهم لما قتل أبا جهل ولما قتل كعب بن الأشرف ولما قتل أهل قبيلة بني النظير ولما قتل كان دفاعا عن النفس أخي رشيد كان هي دفاعا عن النفس يا سلام كعب بن الأشرف كانت دفاعا عن النفس وما أدراك كما قال وما هذا كان يخبئ كعب بن الأشرف لرسول الله أي أنت تقول أنه رحمة للعالمين يعني متسامح وشخص رحمة يعني منتهى الرحمة واحد انتقدوا في بيت شعري يقتله لكي لا تصبح السن وينتقدونه كل العالم ويكتدون ويكسرون لقد قتله نداء من الله فهو لا ينطق من الهوى فالله أمره بقتله فقتله هل القتل هو الرحمة؟ يعني أنت تقول شيء منقد تقول محمد قتل كعب بن الأشرف وتقول أنه رحمة نعم رحمهم رح... لما قتله رحم الآخرين لكي لا يتبعون هذه الأشعار التكفيرية آه إذا بقتل بعض الناس أنت ترحم الآخرين نعم وما تقوم به داعش اليوم في, في سوريا وفي العراق وهذا هو عين الرحمة هو الدفاع عن عن الكفر لقد انت تعلم ان البلاد العربيه اصبح بها الكفر الكثير من الخمر والرق والكثير من الاشياء فهنا يدافعون عن دينهم واسلامهم وطرد المسيحيين من العراق طرد المسيحيين رفضوا دفع الجزيه يا فشيد اذا ينبغي يعني ان يعطوا الجزيه عن يد وهم صاغرون اليس أليس الرحمة عندما يتركونهم يمشون ويستطيعون قتلهم أليس الرحمة؟ طيب أصلا هم هذه بيوتهم يعني يعني تحب الآن تحب الآن في طيب أنا أعطيك سؤال سؤال معاكس أنت الآن في السويد تحب تحب إنه تجي عندك خليني خليني أسألك سؤال واضح صريح أنا أسأل قريبة في السويد لا لا هل تحب في السويد هل تحب أن تأتي السويد لك وتقول لك إما تصير مسيحي إما تدفع الجزية عن يد وأنت صاغر إما تترك نحن السويد ندفع. نحن ندفع الضريبة التي يسمونها الفكت الضريبة ليست هي الجزية نفسها هي الضريبة هي الجزية لا الضريبة تفرد إسلامية. عليك وعلى كل سويدي الجزية لا تفرد على المسلم هي هي جزية مثل مثل الزكاة لا لا, لا ليس مثل الزكاة لا ليس مثل الزكاة ما تضحك علي أنا كنت مسلم الجزية تدفعها عن يد وأنت صاغر الزكاة لا تدفع عن يد وأنت صاغر إن إنما تكون عندها تكون دولة إسلامية لديها قوانين ويجب كل من يعيش في هذه الدولة يحفظ قوانينها يا أخي رشيد وأنت تعيش في أوروبا وتحفظ قوانينها القوا... القوانين التي تذل الإنسان وتأخذ من كرامة الإنسان وتحتقر الإنسان ليست قوانين هي ظلم ممكن يكون في قانون أنه يقول لك أنا أخذ زوجتك هذا ممكن يصير قانون هل تحب أنه يكون قانون يأخذ زوجتك بالعنف يأخذ أموالك وأنت في السويد هل تحب هذا يكون قانون هذا ظلم حتى لو كان قانون القانون هو العدل لكن هو الرحمة موجودة عندما يتركون الشعب الكافر الذي سب الرسول الذي شتم وسوى وأص وكفر يتركونهم يمشون بدون ما يقتلونهم أليس الرحمة؟ 
الرحمة هو أن تترك الناس يعيشون بسلام في بيوتهم دون أن تؤذيهم حتى لو اختلفوا معك في التفكير وفي العقيدة هذا هو الرحمة أما أن تجبرهم أن يتركوا بيوتهم وأموالهم بسبب أنك أنت مسلم وهم من دين آخر هذا قمة الظلم وقمة العدوانية وأنا أشكرك على العموم على الاتصال بنا طيب أنا أكمل لكن هذا هو الإسلام الحقيقي الأخ الذي اتصل من سويد هذا هو الإسلام الحقيقي Takiyah is one of Islam's religiously acceptable forms of deception. It involves lying to protect yourself or to protect the Muslim community. Historically, Takiyah has been much more important for Shia Muslims than for Sunni Muslims because Shias have been in the minority much more frequently than Sunnis. And in order to protect themselves from being persecuted or slaughtered by Sunnis, Shias often had to deny that they're Shias. The prevalence of taqiyya among Shias living in Sunni areas has led many Sunnis to conclude that Shias invented taqiyya, despite the fact that taqiyya is found in the Quran. For instance, in chapter 16, verse 106 of the Quran, Allah says that his wrath abides on any Muslim who decides to reject Islam unless the Muslim is forced to reject Islam while inwardly remaining a true believer. The verse reads, Whoso disbelieveth in Allah after his belief, save him who is forced thereto and whose heart is still content with faith, but whoso findeth ease in disbelief, on them is wrath from Allah. Theirs will be an awful doom. This verse was supposedly revealed after Muhammad's companion, Amr bin Yasser, cursed Muhammad and praised pagan gods while being tortured. Since Amr only cursed Muhammad because he was being tortured, he was forgiven. So, if you're a Muslim and you say, I reject Islam, and you mean it, you're in trouble. But if you're a Muslim and you say, I reject Islam, and you don't mean it, you're okay. Some Muslims insist that this is all there is to taqiyya. It's simply pretending to renounce your faith in order to protect your life. But taqiyya also involves pretending to be friendly towards non-Muslims even though you hate them. In chapter 3, verse 28 of the Quran, we read, Let not the believers take disbelievers for their friends in preference to believers. Whoso doeth that hath no connection with Allah, unless it be that ye but guard yourselves against them, taking, as it were, security. Don't take unbelievers as friends unless it's to guard yourselves against them. Notice that this verse has nothing to do with pretending you're not a Muslim. It's about pretending to be friendly when you don't really want to be friendly. Let's read the most respected Muslim commentary in history on this verse. Tafsir of Ibn Kathir on chapter 3 verse 28 of the Quran. Allah prohibited his believing servants from becoming supporters of the disbelievers or to take them as comrades with whom they develop friendships rather than the believers. Allah warned against such behavior when he said, and whoever does that will never be helped by Allah in any way, meaning whoever commits this act that Allah has prohibited, then Allah will discard him. Allah will discard a Muslim who has a Jewish or Christian or pagan friend. But we've already seen that there is an exception. Ibn Kathir continues, Unless you indeed fear a danger from them, meaning except those believers who, in some areas or times, fear for their safety from the disbelievers. In this case, such believers are allowed to show friendship to the disbelievers outwardly, but never inwardly. For instance, Abu Khari reported that Abu Ad-Darda said, We smile in the face of some people, although our hearts curse them. Abu Khari said that Al-Hassan said, Takiya is allowed until the day of resurrection. Abu Adarda, one of Muhammad's companions, said, We smile in the face of some people, although our hearts curse them. That's how Muhammad's companions understood taqiyya. Why would Muslims need to pretend to be friendly? Because the Quran commands Muslims, Fight those who do not believe in Allah, chapter 9, verse 29. Fight those of the unbelievers who are near to you and let them find in you hardness, chapter 9, verse 123. Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, and those who are with him are severe against disbelievers and merciful among themselves. Chapter 48, verse 29. Muslims are commanded to violently subjugate non-Muslims. But sometimes Muslims aren't in a position to subjugate the unbelievers. What are they supposed to do then? Are they supposed to share their plans and say, we're not going to attack you now, but as soon as we get the chance, we're going to conquer your civilization, put your men to death, rape your wives, and enslave your children? 
Of course not. Countries wouldn't invite them in if they said that. So Allah commands them to pretend to be friendly, giving rise to the Islamic proverb, if you can't cut your enemy's hand, kiss it. Now please don't misunderstand me when I explain what Islam teaches. When I tell you about Islam, I'm not telling you what your Muslim friends believe. So don't think that because Islam commands Muslims to violently subjugate unbelievers, but to pretend to be friendly when outnumbered, your Muslim friends must be lying to you when they say that Islam is a religion of peace. The average Muslim living in the West knows next to nothing about Islam and has been raised with the same values the rest of us were raised with. So when your Muslim friends tell you that Islam is peaceful, they probably believe it. Unfortunately, Islam isn't defined by peaceful westernized Muslim. Islam is defined by Allah and Muhammad, and Allah and Muhammad say, fight the unbelievers unless you can't fight them. And if you can't fight them, deceive them so that they're completely off guard when it's time to fight them. We saw this in the Quran, and we saw it in Islam's most respected commentary on the Quran, which included quotations from Bukhari, Islam's most respected collector of ahadith, and two of Muhammad's companions. So anyone who tells you that Islam doesn't promote this kind of deception either has no clue what he's talking about, or... He's practicing Takiya. Other attacks on the Jewish community in 1920, 1921, 1929 were uh, instigated by a call of the Mufti of Jerusalem, Hajamin al Husseini, who was later uh, sought for war crimes in the Nuremberg trials because he had a central role. Uh, in uh, fomenting the uh, final solution, he flew to Berlin. Uh, Hitler didn't want to uh, exterminate the Jews at the time, he wanted to expel the Jews. And Khaj Amin al Husseini went to Hitler and said, if you expel them, they'll all come here. Uh, so what should I do with them, he asked. He said, burn them. الزواج قسمان القسم الأولاني عقد قران إجراء عقد القران هذا شيء والبناء يعني الدخول على الزوجة هذا موضوع آخر فأما إجراء العقد فهذا أمر يعني ليس له سن معينة في في إجراء العقد يعقد على حتى يمكن أن يعقد على على فتاة عمرها سنة زمان مش تسع سنين ولا سبع سنين ولا ثمانية سنين هذا مجرد عقد إيجاب وقبول بين بس الولي يكون هنا هو الأب لأنه ولي مجبر فتصير زوجته لكن هل هي هل الفتاة أو البنت محل للدخول أم لا طبعا وكم سن الدخول المناسب هذا يختلف باختلاف البيئات وباختلاف الأعراف عند الناس في ممكن في اليمن كانوا يزوجوا من تسعة وعشرة وإحدى عشر وثمانية وثلاثة عشر في بعض الدول تزوج من ستة عشر في بعض الدول أصدرت قوانين ألا يتم الدخول إلا بعد ثمانية عام ولنا في رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قد حسنة حيث عقد على زوجته عائشة وكان سنها ست سنوات وبنى عليها يعني دخل عليها صلى الله عليه وسلم تسع سنوات ست سنوات لا عقد عليها وهي ستة العقد في ستة والبناء اللي هو الدخول 
في تسع سنوات ولنا في رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم نعم اسوه حسنه طب بس خل خليني اوضح لك شغله ولكن طبعا انا انا سؤالي سؤال لك انه واحد عمره 12 سنه واحده عمرها 11 سنه هل هذا الزواج منطقي مجاز شرعيا اذا كان اذا كان الولي الاب الولي ما هو الولايه تنقسم الى قسمين يا يكون الولي هو الاب فاذا زوج الاب ابنته على الرجل الكوف لها فهذا طبعا زواج صحيح يعني في ظروف للناس واحد رجل عنده بنت بنتين ثلاثة أربعة وطبعا يريد أن يسافر لديه ظروف طيب هل تضيع هذه وليس لديه محارم أليس من الأفضل أننا نعقد لها على إنسان تبقى عنده حتى يصونها وحتى وحتى يصرف عليها فإذا ما بلغت سن الدخول دخل عليها وما قال أن الناس كلهم ذئاب كاسرة
The deals are peaceful. History is violent. Wait till you see it. See what? What a man can do to another man. I'm scared. I'm scared too. It will end soon. But before it does, a lot more people gotta die. Well, you know, we do get $1.35 a day, right? <laughs> yeah. Best job I ever had. 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 They're coming. How many? 300 of them. There's five against 300. Well, you never run before. Why are we going to run now? We're still in this fight. We're still in this fight. Now! I understand how Christians think because I was born and raised in a Christian country, America, praise God. And my wife was born and raised in an Islamic country, and she understands how the Muslims think. We're both Jewish, and together, together we have become a team over the last 40 years. My wife also monitors the radio broadcast, TV broadcasts, and newspapers in Arabic of our neighbors. And they say some very terrible things. They say, for example, I'll give you an example. In the summer of 2003, in Jerusalem, on the Temple Mount, the Mufti of Jerusalem, Jerusalem the highest Islamic cleric, Akram Asabri, was quoted as saying, my wife picked up this, his preaching on the Temple Mount. He said, kill the Jews, kill the Christians, kill the Israelis, kill the Americans, kill the monkeys, and kill the pigs. Now, most Americans don't know what the Quran says, but the Quran says some very bad things, and the Hadith, another form of teaching, says some very bad things. The, the Quran teaches in chapter 5, Surah 5, verse 60, it says, Allah cursed those who betrayed him and converted them into monkeys and pigs. Now, it doesn't say the Jews and Christians. But if you want to know who the monkeys and pigs are, all you have to do is ask any six or seven year old Muslim school child here in America that goes to the schools, the Islamic madrasas here in America, funded by the Saudis. And they will tell you, yes, the Jews are the monkeys, the Christians are the pigs. Every Muslim knows this. Now, why are the Jews and Christians hated by Allah? Why are we cursed by Allah? Why are we converted into monkeys and pigs? Because the Jews and the Christians were not willing to accept that Muhammad was the greatest and the latest of the prophets, according to the Muslims. In other words, for the Muslims, Muhammad is greater than Moses for the Jews and greater than Jesus Christ for the Christians. And because the Jews and the Christians, who are one people, we are called Ahl al-Kitab, we are called the people of the book. Because the Jews and the Christians should have known better, according to Islam, therefore our punishment is that much worse. In the Hadith, which is another form of Islamic teaching, it says that Jesus Christ is coming back a second time as a Muslim warrior dressed in black. He will be riding a black steed. He'll be carrying a lance. And he will stab the Antichrist in battle. The Antichrist, by the way, in Arabic is the Dajjal. The Antichrist will be a Jew. And Jesus Christ is a Muslim. And after he kills the Antichrist, he will go up to Jerusalem, pray with 400,000 Muslims, come down, break the crosses, destroy the churches of the Christians, destroy the synagogues of the Jews, and on that day of judgment, all Jews and Christians who are considered the people of the book in Islam, all these Jews and Christians will be put to the sword personally by Jesus Christ, the Muslim. Uh, again, everything I've said until now is very, very strictly adhering to what the Muslims say and believe. Uh, unfortunately, most Americans don't have a clue that the bottom line of Islam is the triumph of Islam, over Judaism, over Christianity, over every religion on the face of the earth. Every religion must be abolished. Um, one of the things I do share indeed, and I, I learn a lot of my own Old Testament from Christians. For example, Zechariah 2 verse 8 says that the Jews are the apple of God's eye. And that anybody who touches the Jews touches the apple of God's eye. In other words, you don't want to touch the apple of God's eye because God's punishment will be terrible. Uh, God loves the Jews. In Romans 9:11. 9 to 11, it says that the, the, the former Gentiles are now, have become part of Israel, the commonwealth of Israel. They're grafted into the Jews. Uh, if God hated the Jews or the Christians, would he have grafted us together? The fact is that God loves the Jews. God loves the Christians. Now, does God love the sinner? Does God love the pagan? God loves the pagans. He loves the Hindus, the Buddhists, and he loves the Muslims too. Why? All human beings are in the image of God. God does not seek the death of any of the human beings on the face of the earth. God seeks the repentance, the faith of every human being on the face of the earth. If we look at Allah, Allah wants to kill the Jews on Saturday. 
He wants to kill the Christians on Sunday. He wants to kill the Hindus, the Buddhists, and the blacks on any day. And then, not necessarily in that order, then the Muslims go ahead and slaughter each other. Sunnis kill Sunnis, Shiites kill Shiites, and Sunnis and Shiites kill each other. Now, I had to give this background, this religious background, to make uh, you understand that even if you are not a Jew or a Christian, even if you are an atheist, you have to understand that the nature of the enemy that is seeking to destroy America and is seeking to destroy the world, the enemy is a religious enemy. It is a satanic religious enemy. It is uh, uh, an enemy that believes in a moon god, war god, and sword god. And even if you don't believe in God, that enemy will still see you as a Judeo-Christian Westerner to be put to the sword. My message is not only for Jews and Christians. My message is not only for Hindus and Buddhists and all people on the face of the earth. My message is even for the Muslims, because I hate it when Muslims kill each other. I love the Muslims very much. And you know, I used to hate Germans. Today, I love the Germans. But I realized that Nazism killed 20 million Germans in World War II. Uh, I love the Russians, but communism just killed 40 million Russians and Ukrainians. Uh, Mao Zedong, only God knows how many Chinese died because of Mao Zedong. Uh, Pol Pot, in this little country of Cambodia, killed two million of his own people. All of these uh, murderers were followers of Satan, in my opinion. And by the way, there are many Jews who believe that Satan, Lucifer, does not exist as a human entity or as an angel. Uh, but, you know, in Judaism, especially if you look at the book of uh, Job, uh, if you look at uh, other books uh, in the Bible, the Old Testament, you will find a personality known as Satan. Of course, the Christians embellished it with Lucifer, the fallen angel. It's in Isaiah 14 also, by the way. Um, and my faith says to me that, uh, that contrary to what the Jewish religion says, the Jewish religion says that Satan is merely the evil inclination that exists in every human being. In other words, you have a choice to do good and evil. If you do evil, then Satan took over. But there is, I believe, a power. Uh, it is, by the way, authorized by God as a test. Uh, but that power is an evil power. And there is an angel who said he was greater than God, and that was the reason for his fall from heaven. And by the way, when the Muslims call to prayer and they say, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar doesn't mean God is great, which is what all your media tells you. Allah Akbar means that Allah is greater. And if you understand that Allah is greater, Allah, the moon god, the war god, the sword god, the god specifically prohibited by the book of Deuteronomy chapter 17. Uh, Allah is a Satan god because Allah hates the Jews, wants them dead on Saturday, hates the Christians, wants them dead on Sunday, hates the Hindus, the Buddhists, the blacks. And I think uh, Allah hates the Muslims because in the name of Allah, the Muslims slaughter each other. And the bottom line of Islam, basically, is the destruction of the earth and the human race. This is my faith. Emotions as to what's happening. And of course, yesterday, the beheading of another American journalist. Um, it just doesn't seem like this administration gets it. All right. Um, let's, let's talk about the uh, Christian execution just for a moment. We're seeing it, but we don't seem to be that disturbed about it. I just don't understand that. But there is no negotiation. You either convert completely to Islam or you're dead. Is that, that basically it, right? Absolutely. Even if you are a Muslim, I, yesterday I watched a beheading. I watch beheadings every day. It makes me sick. I just don't post them anymore because people are so desensitized to, to the thing. A guy was just delivering military uniform. He was a delivery guy and he was a Muslim and he was begging for dear life and declaring the Shahadatan in Islam. It made no difference. There was a video of a Christian who converted to Islam. It made no difference because in their view, you still have to pay the penance. And that is by killing you in your throat. So don't make any difference what you do. You're going to die. End of story. Amen. That's it. Wow. All right. So um, could they be wiped out? I mean, if we had an administration that took these acts as acts of war, could they be wiped out? Yes, but the problem with the administration, the problem really is with the American psyche and how they think. Mm -hmm. The wisdom says that, you know, uh, no matter who we aid in the Middle East from the Muslim sects, it doesn't matter. From Reagan's era all the way to Obama's, from Reagan's era, we aided the Mujahideen to fight the communists in Russia that gave birth to the Taliban. In Obama's era, all the way down, uh, we have the 
disintegration of secular governments and the reversal of Sykes-Picot is exactly what ISIS wants. And we've seen, we are seeing currently the results. Right now we're aiding the Bishmarka, you know, and they're really uh, taking the weapons from the Christians. Christians are not allowed to carry weapons in the Kurdish regions to defend themselves. Absolutely. You know, in, in Amos chapter 9, verse 15, God says, I will plant them in their land and no longer shall they be pulled up. One half of a verse that talks about the state of Israel. In other words, it's going to be established and it's impossible to uproot it. Now, is this half a verse a historic reference? It can't be. They were uprooted by the Romans. It's talking about the time that we live in now. And it was impossible for me as a Palestinian to uproot Israel. It's impossible. We tried in 67, we tried in 48, we tried in 73 in Yom Kippur War or Harb Ramadan as we called it. We failed miserably. So I began to ask myself the question, either the author of the Bible was a perfect guesser or there is a God. So I chose the latter than the first. There is a God. I came from somewhere. You know, I'm not buying the theory of evolution that I came from slime. You know, I mean, the evolutionists should get their own dirt to make man. It's impossible. And so I, I, I look at life much simpler than these complicated, you know, uh, sophists that I see every day on television. Mm -hmm. I can't stand it. I look at life much simply. They want to kill us. And in, in the past, I wanted to kill you. And then I began to look at you and say, is this the person I wanted to kill? Is this the Jew I wanted to kill? This is a poor individual. Why? What for? Let him live. Let the Jews live. Let the Muslims live. Let everybody live. Let us discuss theology and let us debate theology and let us each make his own mind in freedom and liberty. Wow, that is so beautifully said. All right, I want to come back to... Um... The issue is Islam. You, you know, you want to reform Islam, so you get somebody with three-piece suit to talk about this is not true Islam and this is the true Islam. And so you get Dr. Zuhdi Jasser who has a handful of followers, uh, yet you, you don't find scholarly Muslims uh, to say this is really Islam and we need to reform it. It's not going to happen. There is no reformation of Islam. Uh, show me the reformers. Who are they? What's their name? What is the theology? What is their manuals? Where are the libraries that talk about reformed Islam or democratic Islam? The Middle East has always been in decay because of Islam. Islam is the problem. Mm -hmm. And as long as we keep pussyfooting around this issue, we're never going to solve the problem. Well, it, uh, and I'm going to run out of time, and thank you for your, your transparency here. I think the Christian community, the, the, the faith community in America, is standing back not knowing what to do. Uh, we are now in the crosshairs of this organization, the ISIS and other uh, fundamentalists. Um, scripture says, uh, pray for your enemy, turn the other cheek. Um, I, I think we're caught, we just don't know what to do. Uh, we we want to fight, but is that biblically correct? Uh, how are you wrestling this? Well, I look at Matthew 25 when Jesus says, for I was hungry, you gave me food, I was naked, you clothed me, I was in prison, you visited me. To feed, to protect, to defend takes action. It takes amount of work. What Jesus was saying is that if you don't do this kind of work, you really never had faith in me. Depart to the left, you evil doers, doers of iniquity. We have sold the American Christian a bill of easy believism. Mm. We gave them four spiritual law in a booklet, and we forgot to tell the Christian, when you see the apartment building burning, you got to risk your life to save that old lady burning in that building. You know, and th that's the problem. We forgot the essence of what the reason Christ came. We think that Christ came only to save us. Christ came to destroy the works of the devil. That was the purpose of Christ's coming. That's what it says in the book of John, you know. So it's very clear. Christ came to destroy the works of the devil. And if we are to be Christ-like, we also have to work to destroy the works of the devil. And if Jesus says no love is like when a man dies for his friend, that's the greatest love. Well, how does a man die for his friends? He commits suicide, or he defends his friends, or he defends his wife, or defends his homeland, or he defends his fellow Christian, or he defends the Jews. You know, to be Christ-like and to die for your friends has to take an element of defense. The Bible does talk about defense. We isolate Old from New Testament. 
We think that the whole Old Testament is done away with in every, in every way. When the New Testament talks very well about the valiancy of Abraham, of Jephthah in warfare. So, you know, we allow Israel to fight. We as Christians say, Israel, they're holy, they can fight. You know, it's in the Holy Bible that they can fight, but the Christians can't fight. That's hypocritical. If Israel has a right to fight, Christianity also has a right to fight. Wow. Uh, that was prophetic. Thank you, my friend. You're in our prayers. Uh, we value greatly uh, the opportunity to talk to you and look forward to doing it many more times in the future. The best way for people to correspond with you is through your website. Shubat.com, S-H-O-E-B-A-T.com. Just as you spell the word shoe and the word bat, one word, dot com. <laughs> All right, thanks. Good to see you. God bless you, my friend.